for over a decade now, I've believed that this was the greatest Iron Man run. But is it possible that I was wrong? We're proof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus, aka the Mad Dog, and we're back with another video. Written by Matt Fraction and illustrated by Salvador La Roca, the first issue of The Invincible Iron Man was published by Marvel Comics in May of 2008, with the duo leaving the title over 60 issues later at number 527, which was published in 2012. And Tony Stark finds himself at the forefront of a new world, with the ramifications of civil war still lingering throughout the universe. The line between friend and foe is bleary for Iron Man, but when the sun is staying as good in for him and using his own technology against him, Tony will be forced on a journey that will see him risk everything that he has. From Norman Osborn taking over S.H.I.E.L.D. to the resurgence of Hammer and the Mandarin plot in his revenge the entire time, can Tony Stark rise from the ashes of his past or will he be destined to burn in the flames of his enemies? Okay now to put your mind at ease, I'm not going to just say that everything in this run is great because of the fact that I've hyped it up in so many other videos and to prove that, the art is genuinely awful when it comes to human beings. It's so bizarre that the Iron Man armors look more realistic than any character's face. And to prove this in the early notes, I wrote that it looks like it has been done based off what a description of a human is, but without ever having seen one before. And I didn't want to start off this review by bashing something, but it's the first thing that I noticed. Like very early on, they have a big character within the Marvel Universe feature in this, but he's introduced in his human form and I genuinely didn't have a clue who he was. And sure, yeah, it does get better the longer that the run went on, and hopefully you've noticed that I'm not blaming this entirely on La Roca, because I'm not really sure where it went wrong. It could have been with the inking, it could have been with the colours, or the shading, or it could have actually just been the pencils. But unfortunately, especially in those early issues, every time I was looking at a human, there was just something that wasn't right. As well, it got so bad that at one point I couldn't tell certain characters apart. Pepper and Cave became interchangeable partway through this run, and it didn't really help because of the fact that Tony had a romantic interest in both of them, along with the vast majority of the women in this run. But unless I looked at the clothing or someone mentioned them by name, I got these two confused quite a lot. It doesn't help as well that some characters are clearly based off real world people, because that really threw me out of the book on a few occasions. Like congratulations to Danny DeVito and Paris Hilton for making it in this book, but that's really not as impressive now in 2022. So we did unfortunately make it so that this book aged quite badly because of that. But for an Iron Man book, the mechs are the main thing to me, and LaRocca absolutely nails it. This is some of the best pencils that I've ever seen for the armor, and it looks absolutely amazing in every single fight. And the photorealistic style that he has works to its advantage here. I'd find myself just lingering on some of the pages where Iron Man was flying through the sky or fighting fighting an enemy, and when I've thought about this run over the years and the reason why I enjoy it so much, those images are the ones that have stuck in my mind the most. So for as much as I'm trashing the look of the humans in this, it does at least get the main thing right, and it still has that wow factor over 10 years later. On top of that, I love the way that the art played with the futuristic aspect that you can get from Stark's technology. He really took it to the next level with its designs, especially as it got towards the end, and it felt like the knowledge of the tech compounded so that it was continually evolving, and it wasn't just something that peaked at the beginning. Additionally, his action is phenomenal. The components I love from other big artists at the time, such as damage, movements having weight, and the environment coming into play was really good here. Especially the fights during the Most Wanted arc, which was quite early on in this run, but they felt choreographed as if they were coming straight out of a movie. But the longer that the series went on, these scenes became few and far between. Which was a shame because for me, this was a real selling point of the series. It didn't just rely on Iron Man being in the sky and shooting at an opponent from a safe distance. It mixed it up quite a lot, and some of the most exciting Iron Man fights that I've seen in one of his solo series are contained in this run. Also, despite me bashing some elements of this book, the backgrounds and layouts were always great. Cities always felt claustrophobic with the buildings, the helicarrier was always busy, and scenes with the dwarves always had warmth to them. It's obvious to me to see why LaRocca went on to do something like Star Wars because his skills are best when there's such an open variety of terrains. And it is just great to see how he evolved as an artist when he went on to do Darth Vader. And this might seem like I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel to give this run yet another comment compliment, but it's just impressive because of how long this run was. They just stayed with the same artist throughout. As much as I call it Iron Man by Matt Fraction, he is Iron Man by Matt Fraction in Salvador La Roca. So even though the faces in this are, you know, what they are. It was just nice having that familiarity with a run of this size. It's the reason why I collected this run in so many different formats, and it's why I also hope that they bring out an omnibus. And if this ever does get an omnibus, or you just want to get some of the ones that are already available, you can pick them up from the channel sponsor, Organic Price Books. They've got great packaging, fast shipping, and amazing customer services, and if you use code WOOF WOOF, you'll get $2 off your order. And if you're ordering three or more books and you want them to be delivered together, make sure you use code WOOF WOOF, ship it together for 5% off your entire order. 
Don't worry, you can just copy and paste them from the description down below and you can use these codes as many times as you like. It's a bit difficult to just give a general opinion because there's so many different story arcs and they weren't all created equally. So I'm not going to do a spoiler section and I'm just going to go through it arc by arc. So if there's a certain part that you don't want to hear about, I'll leave timestamps down below. But I went into this run with high expectations and even higher levels of nostalgia. But unfortunately, it doesn't come running straight out the gates. And don't get me wrong, Five Nightmares is a really strong introduction, especially for people who would have tried to jump into this series after watching the first Iron Man movie. But for a hero that can fly at pretty much the speed of light, this starts off a bit slow. I also just wasn't a fan of the repeated cliche that the villain always has to be someone that's smarter than Tony. Give him an opponent that's dumb as shit because it'll be difficult for him to predict what he's gonna do because of the fact that the guy isn't thinking to begin with. Wait, that kind of sounds like me. Like, it's fine if there's just a handful of them. If you've got just the Mandarin or Norman Osborn being able to plan something that Tony couldn't figure out, I can let that slide. But literally everybody that he goes up against in this book has to be smarter than him. In saying that, I did really warm up to Ezekiel Stain by the end of this book because it played into his strengths. The fact that he is pretty much a younger but evil version of Stark. So although it was slow to start with, I did like that it really gained momentum and it set the tone for what the rest of this run would be. It was a great learning curve for Tony that he understood quickly that he always needs to be at the forefront of technology. Otherwise, it's going to pass him by and he won't be able to keep up. And one confusing thing that happened in Five Nightmares, but also continued throughout the rest of this run, was the relationships. I couldn't remember where Tony was romantically before this run started, but it really alluded to the fact that him and Pepper were together until he's flirting with a bunch of supermodels. And then Maria Hill gets involved. And there's parts throughout this run where they are positioned as if they are going to be the main love interest. And this is also one of those runs that doesn't really need that to make it a great story. But it gives us so many of them throughout this book that it's a bit confusing to know where any of them stand. And yeah, this is spoilers for the final issue, but none of these relationships even mattered in the end. Like, yeah, I get that he's a playboy at heart, but don't introduce so many love interests in that case. Have him just go off with a bunch of supermodels every couple of issues, I'm definitely not going to be complaining about that. But the arc after this, Most Wanted, was where this run started to show just how good it could be. When I think back on Fraction's time with this character, this is the part that I remember most. Because it highlights everything great that he managed to do. It's been well over a decade since I read Secret Invasion or cared about anything that was happening in Dark Reign. This told me everything that I needed to enjoy the story without needing some kind of recap issue. As well, Norman Osborn was just a fantastic antagonist. I'm in full belief that he could take on the majority of the Marvel Universe and he's actually a better Iron Man villain than some of his own rogues gallery. And because of that, he made the corporate side of the story as interesting as the Iron Man stuff. And even better than that was Tony being willing to do whatever it took for the greater good. The information Osborn wants most is inside Tony's brain and it's just interesting to see that he is willing to destroy his greatest asset to make sure that Osborn doesn't win. And what's best is that in the midst of this company-wide spanning event, this became a more personal and emotional story. As it was sad to see Tony slowly losing his ability and his memory to the point where the narration started making no sense. And the few people that he still had around him just kind of had to facilitate that. There was even a really nice moment where Tony didn't seem to remember what happened during Civil War. The only disappointment with this is that we didn't get much time with Tony at the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. I get that that's more because of the events of Secret Invasion, it's not like Matt Fraction could have just overwritten this, but I just wish it could have lasted past the first arc because it was a really interesting element that we lost too soon. Another great aspect of this arc, and also this run overall, was Pepper. She was off on her own mission which did connect to the main plot, but it was just nice to see her as something more than Tony's assistant. They changed her physiology in this run so that she could have more of an impact and it just worked really well. She also got her own armour too which looked great and I just loved that moment where she stood her ground when they tried to confiscate it. And this was something that carried throughout the rest of the run which was great in those moments where it felt like the Tony story was kind of treading water. But don't worry we're gonna talk about that in this review. The only major negative that I have with the most wanted arc was Maria's storyline. At first I liked her being there. She was the last connection that Tony had to shield. Or whatever it was that Norman Osborn called it. But then it goes into this weird fetch quest that involves the controller and it honestly just felt like the book was just slamming the brakes on when it got to these moments. Like it did redeem itself when it connected back to the main plot but I felt deflated when I'd turn the page and I'd see it was about Maria Hill. To give it some credit though, it did incorporate another character from within the Marvel Universe really well and I loved the stuff with Madame Mask. And that was the strength of the whole run. It managed to incorporate pretty much every main member of Iron Man's rogues gallery quite effortlessly. I can't think of any of them that felt proper forced into the story. It was always natural and organic. However, nothing can go full steam forever. And Stark Disassembled doesn't manage to capitalise on the phenomenal momentum that was built up in Most Wanted. It really could have been a couple of issues shorter or at least just change the main location a couple more times. It wasn't straight up bad 
aside though, there was this really fun storyline about some kind of ghost secret agent that was hunting them, which was the biggest thing that was giving this storyline any kind of movement. And it did incorporate a few more characters from the wider Marvel Universe, which gave it a bit more variety. But all in all, it did feel like it was stalling for time and trying to clean up some of the messier parts of Most Wanted, just so that it could be ready for the heroic age when it probably needed some kind of fresh start. And that kind of determined just how well this run was doing, and it's the reason why I've decided to go through this arc by arc. But how it reacted to the events of the wider Marvel Universe determined just how enjoyable this story could be. Dark Reign, great job, it made me want to see more of Norman Osborn. Heroic Age, decent, it managed to land on its feet. Fear itself, well... Just wait. Stark Resilient is a storyline that takes us through to the Heroic Age and it diverts its attention from Iron Man to Stark himself. It felt like the book was going in a different direction and I didn't realise that that was what I wanted. Seeing Tony put the business first was great and it opened a lot of opportunities for different storylines. Don't get me wrong, it's not all business though and I really like the storyline that was going on with Detroit Steel. Having the Hammer Girls orchestrate this plot because again we need another villain that is smarter than Tony was fun to see unfold. And honestly the whole demeanour of this thing, the tongue and cheek comedy felt like it was going to be one of those TV shows that you'd often see in GTA. This was also the part of the run where Rhodey became more of his own character and they gave him a lot more to do. There were some great moments with him but his plot lines often just felt like there was some kind of DLC. I know they launched a spin-off series for him that was called Iron Man 2.0 so I'm not sure if the real like meaty parts of his story were saved for there but it was just nice to see him in this run. I loved his upgraded armor and when he also would connect to the main plot but from being honest and it might sound a bit mean I don't think I would have noticed much if his plot line wasn't here. Then there's a couple of issues that revolve around Doc Ock and these were fantastic. Sure yes I'm a hypocrite because less than a minute ago I complained that we've got this constant barrage of villains that have to be smarter than Stark but then they also seem to give it a bit of a free pass if it's for a Spider-Man villain but with how good this storyline was I just don't care. It was great as well because I knew exactly where this connected with Doc Ock's story which is one of the strengths of having a connected continuity. I felt a bit disappointed in the conclusion to this arc but in essence it was pretty much just Stark and Ock just having a conversation for a couple of issues. But it kept me engaged throughout, it had this threat that was being held over Stark's head and that's why like I said I think it could have ended on a stronger note especially because of the fact that this wasn't very many issues. But at least it didn't drag it out and really overstates welcome, kinda like the fear itself tie-in arc. Dear God was this a struggle to get through. Now admittedly I wasn't reading Fear Itself alongside this, despite the fact that it is currently the season of events. And I'm not discrediting the fact that that might have helped improve this experience, but I don't think that it would have saved this storyline. The worst bit is that this actually started out pretty well. It had the stuff with the great gargoyle, Pepper looked like she was going to have an interesting story arc. But Tony is mostly just sitting around waiting for something to happen in Fear Itself so that he can get involved. Actually. Worse than that, Matt Fraction wrote Fear Itself. How did this dude do a better job at writing this series when he had to work around other people's events and not really fully know what the intricacies of that might have been ahead of time, you know, kind of like he had to do at the beginning of this run, than he did when he just had to work around his own event? It's like being able to run a marathon and not knowing what obstacles are going to be there, but still tripping over your own shoelaces. Credit where it's due, it did try to expand on Tony's personal issues with alcohol again, which is one of the more interesting aspects of this character that I feel like a a lot of people don't really want to touch on heavily since Demon in a Bottle, but it just felt a bit arbitrary in that Matt Fraction had this idea but he didn't know how he could connect the dots, and got to this part and realised that there was nothing else more interesting for Tony to be doing, and just went, yeah he's drinking again, blame it on the dwarves. Speaking of which, all the dwarves in this arc were fucking irritating. This actually reminded me of the main bugbear that I had with this Hawkeye run, that he'll have something that's sort of funny and might get like a little smirk, and he just won't know when to drop it. That feels like a weird problem for me to bring up. It's not like I do that kind of thing and um, you know, by the way, New 52 still my jam. But the dwarf censorship was so difficult to stomach after the second issue. That's how quickly I got annoyed at this. Yeah, I don't have a lot of patience. I hated the dwarves in this storyline and the worst part is that both the good and the bad aspects of this arc carry through throughout the rest of the run. Split Lip should have stayed in the Fear Itself arc that he came from. Actually, that kind of sounds like I'm being weirdly racist. Because the problem is, Split Lip's just sort of there. Again, it's just a case of Fraction not knowing what he can leave behind and he just became this weird sort of unfunny comedic relief. And maybe I'm in the minority, but he just didn't add anything positive to me reading experience. However, I did like that Tony's sobriety carried over from Fear itself. And just fair warning, the last three arcs, Demon, Long Way Down and Future, I'm just going to talk about generally because admittedly they're all a bit of a blur to me. I sped through them that quickly that I can't tell you where one arc finishes and another begins. And I don't really want to spoil too much about the ending of this book for people who maybe have 
haven't read it yet because I would definitely recommend this. And admittedly, I just wanted to slag off the Fear Itself storyline, so I had to at least get to that bit. It's a shame there was a think back on this run because there's nothing wrong with everything after Fear Itself because that was definitely, definitely the lowest part of this series. We just never manages to hit the same highs that it had early on. It does everything right, but it doesn't take as many risks, so it feels like it's just pretty much a solid enough Iron Man story. The build-up's great and there's teases very early on that there's going to be this massive finale coming up and you can't do a storied Iron Man run without featuring the Mandarin but there's a lot of things that conveniently all happen at the same time so that Tony's put in a position where he can face him and I just feel like it could have been a bit smarter in its approach. It didn't have to feel as rushed or that things just all conveniently happened but I loved how so many of the villains that featured earlier on in this run all came back to sort of gang up on Tony. It's kind of that classic trope of yeah you might be able to beat us individually but can you beat us as a team? And narratively it reminded me a lot of when I reviewed Green Arrow by Jeff Lemire but there was this side plot involving a mole that had infiltrated Stark Resilient and it really overstayed its welcome. It just felt like this was dragged out and by the time that they actually revealed who the mole was I just didn't even care anymore. And also to facilitate that plot and not make it immediately obvious who the mole is they bring in so many new characters that I just didn't really care about any of them. They did once again include some Spider-Man villains which was interesting to see but it wasn't as interesting as Doc Ock or Norman Osborn and with all those new characters one of them even gets into a relationship with one of the main characters and I have no idea how that came about. In these last few arcs though they really stepped it up with all the technology and some of the most imaginative moments came within these last couple of issues. There were a ton of mechs that were just thrown into this and I wish that I could have read this part when I was younger because the action was just phenomenal and it really was the pinnacle of this story. Yeah sure I might have liked Stark vs Osborn more because it was just a bit more gritty but in terms of just Iron Man action, I do think it saved the best bits for the end. But the weirdest thing is that this run ends well, but it just feels like there's no weight to it. I'm talking specifically about the characters here, and I get that it's set within the 616 universe, and I'm not sure as well if this ended at pretty much the exact same time that Avengers vs X-Men started, which is something that I recently reviewed on the channel, and I had my criticisms about Iron Man there, so you might want to check that out. But I've read stuff like Jeff Johns' Green Lantern, that even though that was in a similar situation, they needed to make sure that other people could still write this character. It felt like it had a satisfying conclusion and with how long this one went on and how enjoyable it was for the most part I just wish it could have stuck the landing a bit more and maybe had a bit more of a punch But I found myself wondering that if I read another Iron Man run that takes place after this one Would this have had any impact on it? Is there any lasting consequence as a result of this and that might be a bit of an unfair criticism without checking those series out But just feel like it could have had a bit more oomph to it And I felt like it was ending because it had to and not because it had a point to its ending The only thing that I do think it sets up really well is the future of Stark resilient and I'd really be interesting to see how the business aspect of that develops because that was the most surprising thing that I did enjoy about this run that it got me so invested in that side of the story. There are quite large parts of this run where Iron Man isn't involved, there's even a storyline where they get rid of it which was also really enjoyable and that's what I'm saying that in these last three arcs there was a lot that I really liked but there was nothing that really stood out especially when I compare it to the beginning of the book. That's not me saying that it's bad though and I do think that all things considered for the most part this is pretty much the most comprehensive comprehensive Iron Man run that I've ever read. It does have that continuing narrative that started from the beginning. Besides the stuff during Fear itself, it never loses sight of that and it even sort of redeems Ezekiel a bit. So I am glad that I came back to this run and I do think it still holds up today. This is my final verdict. And Iron Man's had a truly unique journey. Before 2008, he was the character that comic fans knew with a couple of go-to runs, but he wasn't exactly a household name. And with the unexpected success of the movie, there had to be an easy jumping on point. Sure, yes, Busiek and Michelini and a few others over the years had left their mark on the character, but Fraction was set the near impossible task of leading this new series for new fans whilst navigating the constantly evolving Marvel Universe. All eyes would have been on this title, and all things considered, he did a great job. Is every art great? No. And the quality very much depends on how well he can adapt to the ongoing events such as Dark Reign and Fear itself, which means that the storytelling isn't always consistent. And if you aren't familiar with those eras of Marvel, it might leave you a little bit confused. However, despite the uphill battle that he had to work against, it just told a great story about Tony Stark, balancing all of his allies and his rogues, and still taking the time to propel the character further in the true spirit of who Tony Stark is. The art is great, you know, when it's not focused on humans, and this is one of those runs that truly did the best it could with everything that it had. It does still hold up for the most part and for a character that's often overlooked it's just great that there's another run that is perfect for both old readers and new. It comes highly recommended if you've got the time and you're already a fan of the Marvel Universe even if it isn't as great as I remember it being and because of that I'm going to give it a decent enough score of 75%.
with what so that's the video and hopefully you enjoyed it but until next time just make sure that you stay safe and stay mad all you dogs with woof see you at the next video